too early. I, I do appreciate the, the opportunity to talk a little bit about Coates disease. Uh, most of you know all about Coates disease. Some of you know intimately about Coates disease. I, I'm going to share with you sort of my perspective as someone who sees patients but also does research in Coates disease on what are the challenges with trying to find a cure for Coates disease. So I guess I'm just going to ask for the next slide. Yeah. Um, so first question is what is Coates disease? And most of you know it's, it's a rare eye condition uh, and it affects the retinal blood vessels. So this is a picture actually of a normal retina and you can see the blood vessels sort of starting off in the center and uh, branching um, towards the periphery. And the retina, either by design or evolution, I mean it's perfect. And it was designed to really, for us to be able to see as well as we do. Uh, however, in Coates disease, those same blood vessels aren't so perfect. Uh, next slide. Um, I guess one more as well. Uh, so in Coates disease, these blood vessels end up being abnormal. They're, um, they sort of stop abruptly, they're twisted, uh, and they leak fluid. And it's that leaking of fluid from these abnormal blood vessels that gets underneath the retina and that's really the cause of vision loss. Um, but that's about as much as we understand about this very unusual disease. It's very descriptive our understanding uh, and it does limit what we can do to treat it. Uh, next slide please. So who gets Coates disease? So as many of you are aware, most commonly it seems to be diagnosed in children uh, and that's in part because it's congenital. Uh, and it's discovered when we're fortunate early, uh, sometimes much later. Uh, and in these kids, it's unilateral, so it's in one eye. Um, and finally, there's, uh, there's no systemic uh, manifestations of Coates disease. Uh, so you have this rare disease in children that affects one eye. Although it's congenital, it's non-familial, meaning if you identify someone who has it, you don't have a group of people who have it, just the one person. And really the eye is where all the information is. Next slide. So what happens with kids with Coates disease? Uh, oftentimes they're asymptomatic. They really just don't have any symptoms. Um, it doesn't mean that it isn't affecting their vision, but since you have two eyes, you may not notice when you're losing vision in one eye. And if you're four, you're probably not going to complain if you're not seeing as well as everyone else is. Alternatively, as it progresses, you can get these large retinal detachments where you get all the fluid under the retina, and that's when patients start losing vision. Uh, next slide. If it progresses and it doesn't get effective treatment, people can actually lose their eye. Uh, when these retinas are detached for a long time, the, the eye starts compensating by creating new blood vessels, often in the front of the eye, uh, that leads to very high pressure and you can actually get a, what's called a blind painful eye and the treatment for that uh, is just to remove the eye. Next slide. So how do we treat Coates disease? So the basic goal, well in, in surgery in general, there's an idea, when in doubt, cut it out. And in the eye, we don't cut things out, but we effectively either burn them with the laser or we freeze them with cryotherapy. And that, for, for decades, was really our treatment options for most eye diseases. You can see on the left, there's some laser spots. It's a very small area. On the right, there's pretty extensive cryotherapy where we freeze the eye. Um, and what we're trying to do is attack the part of the retina that's abnormal and try to save that very central vision. But if this progresses uh, and the uh, retina detaches, next slide, um, we can't do those options. And so then we're left with surgery. We actually have to go in and either externally drain the fluid or, or enter the eye. And, and this is, these are the patients that really don't do so well. Next slide, please. So the idea was maybe things have changed recently with the discovery of this new therapy which targets a single molecule. Um, a single gene called VEGF. Um, many of you may have heard that about this molecule. It has different sort of approaches to basically target this one molecule. And it's been extremely successful, this uh, treatment, for many eye diseases, for wet macular degeneration, for diabetic eye disease, for retinal vein occlusion. It really has changed our practice. Uh, and there have been some papers suggesting that Coates disease patients have elevated levels of this 
this protein, VEGF, that causes blood vessels to leak. So we started injecting patients with anti-VEGF therapy. And to be quite honest, depending on who you ask, you get a different answer as to how effective it is. In some people it works pretty well, and they're very fortunate, and other people it doesn't work quite as well. And typically it's used in combination with either laser treatment or the cryotherapy. Next slide. So is anti-VEGF therapy a cure for Coats disease? And I think the, the answer is clearly no. Um, there has been some success with anti-VEGF therapy, um, but that's when we find patients and we make the diagnosis very early. Uh, and it does require often very frequent treatments. These medications often have, have to be given every month. Uh, and one of the obstacles of Coats disease is that there's a delay in diagnosis because we don't necessarily know when these kids develop these large amounts of fluid under the retina. Uh, and every time they need an injection at a young age, they actually need to go to the operating room and sometimes they get general anesthesia. Um, so the outcome now for Coats disease is actually not as good as we'd like it to be. Um, most patients with Coats disease are legally blind. So despite these treatments, despite the introduction of anti-VEGF therapy, we're still finding that most patients with Coats disease lose vision, lose significant vision in their affected eye. And we think to cure Coats disease, we really need to identify biomarkers, things to identify these kids early, as well as new targets to treat this disease. Uh, next slide. So what our lab does, and it does this with uh, other vascular diseases, is we use a combination of um, cell-based therapies, so you can click there, um, animal models, uh, as well as patient samples to try to identify uh, novel diagnostic biomarkers and therapeutic targets for different vascular diseases. Um, next slide. And what, you can go one more actually. Uh, what the focus is um, today and what you've helped us do is to make that last part a reality in Coates disease. Um, and that's to create a biobank. So what is a biobank? A biobank is effectively a, it's a bank, a repository where we take patient samples, they're anonymized, but we keep them stored with all the information minus the identification of these patients so that they can be used in clinical uh, research studies. Uh, and the idea is to use these uh, samples to help us identify new biomarkers or therapeutic targets. Next slide. So what, what is the power of a bio, biobank? Why do we want to create these biobanks? And they're being created across the United States. There are universities that have invested a lot of um, their funds to creating uh, uh, university-wide biobanks. Um, however, our um, lab at, at Hopkins actually now has one of the largest biobanks in the country. And we've been able to use those uh, tissue from these patients to uh, confirm the expression of novel targets that we identify in the lab We've been able to correlate the, uh, these uh, expression levels to the level of disease, and some of these may potentially act as diagnostic biomarkers. Um, we can actually tell what contribution these uh, molecules might have uh, in these different diseases. And what's interesting now, we can actually take those samples, and rather than testing therapies in patients, we can actually taste, test them in the, uh, the samples before we even take them to the patient. Uh, and finally, we can validate or invalidate therapies uh, just using these patient samples. Next slide. So one of the big obstacles with biobanking and Coates disease or getting that third arm of what we need for doing effective research, which is human tissue, is that, as I described, Coates disease is very rare, so we don't see that many patients. It affects children, and it's <coughs> challenging to get, to get samples from children. It's sporadic, so even though it's congenital, if we find someone who has it, it's not that we can then go to their entire family and start collecting samples and get information. Typically, it's just that patient. There's no systemic manifestation, so we, we really need to look in the eye to find information about that disease. So to overcome these obstacles, with the help of your foundation, um, our lab at Hopkins has established this biobank where our sole purpose is to try to generate uh, a, a database of tissue that can be used to do the research that will lead to new treatments, new diagnose, diagnostic markers, 
and new therapies for, for Coates disease. And ultimately, we'd like this to be uh, available not just to our lab or to Hopkins, but around the world. Next slide. So where are we now? So right now, we've established the biobank, and that was largely uh, with your help. Um, and we are now recruiting clinicians nationwide to start depositing samples uh, in this biobank. The next step is to then provide these um, tissue samples to investigators around the world. And many of these people aren't working on Coates disease now. We want them working on Coates disease. We want the people working on diabetes, macular degeneration, retinal vein occlusion. There's many people working on those diseases. We want them working on Coates disease. And one of the ways we can entice them to do so is to give them the tools they need to do so. And we think this biobank provides that for them. Uh, next slide. Um, but to be clear, the, the tissue itself isn't enough. I mean, we can give them these tissue samples, but they're still going to need to be doing the experiments, hiring people to work with them. Uh, and so there's still a need for additional funds. And I think, though, with the help of this biobank and recruiting these new investigators, uh, we have an opportunity, and a very unique opportunity in a rare disease, uh, to identify no uh, novel diagnostic biomarkers and really new treatments for Coates disease. Uh, final slide. So again, I, I want to thank all of you for, for making this possible, for allowing our lab to uh, participate in what we think will be this, um, this move forward towards a treatment for, for Coates disease.